Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Safe House, brought to you by The Safe House Initiative. I'm Jeff Edwards, co-chair of The Safe House Initiative and your host for today's podcast. Safe House Initiative has quickly grown in popularity around the world, and as such, we have discovered like-minded organizations that are dedicated to making our digital landscape safer and more secure. This episode, we have the pleasure of learning about the Cyber Resilience Center for London, and better yet, meeting their Chief Executive Officer, Simon Newman. He is the charismatic driving force behind this important organization. Simon, welcome to the Safe House. Thank you, Jeff. Great to be with you. So why don't you tell us a little bit how you got involved in all this? <laughs> That's a good question. So, uh, well, the Cyber Resilience Centre London uh, launched back in October 2022. So we're, we're just over a year old. Uh, I've been working in cyber for around about five or six years, although I should add that I'm not um, someone with a technical qualification or technical background. Uh, my background's primarily working in UK government, uh, where I've been um, sort of specialising in policy uh, mm-hmm. within something the UK and the Home Office, which is equivalent to your homeland security uh, in the US. Um, mm-hmm. But I realised, I guess, with my work that technology was becoming more and more uh, entwined in the way that we work. And uh, and from that, I started to get really interested in how cyber was evolving and particularly the way that criminals were using it to target businesses, individuals and, and others. And so that kind of piqued my interest. And when I came back to the UK from working uh, away for a few years in the Middle East, um, got an opportunity to get involved in London and uh, and focusing on helping businesses kind of make them aware of what those cyber risks are. So you got involved with the CRC is what it's called, correct? Yeah, that's right. And, and why don't you tell us uh, about uh, the CRC and, and the work you do, because I find it fascinating what you've told me so far. Sure. So the Cyber Resilience Centre for London is actually one of nine centres across England and Wales, uh, and they are partnerships between policing, uh, with government and also with industry uh, and academia as well. The focus of the centre in London is about helping small and medium sized businesses reduce their vulnerability to common cyber risks. So to give you an idea, we have about one million uh, SMEs or SMBs, you might call them in the US, uh, in London. Around about 90 percent of those are what we call micro businesses. So that means they have between nine and and nine staff. And we reckon around about one third of businesses suffer at least one cyber attack or a breach per Mm. year. So that gives you an indication of kind of the scale and the nature of the problem. So really, the CRC is there to help educate people, make them understand what those common cyber threats are, and the really simple stuff that everyone can do just to reduce their vulnerability. So you're part of a a network of sorts. Can you describe that network a bit more and how you interact with each other? Yeah, so we have a common model that we all follow, and that model is really about um, sort of a membership or building a community of businesses where they can come and get support uh, and, and help. So it's about building trust with those businesses. We work with a, a group of universities to deliver a student capability called CyberPath. And that's mm. about giving them opportunities to develop commercial skills and industry. Uh, and, and hopefully they'll then go on to, to join the industry and become cybersecurity specialists themselves. We also work with some cybersecurity companies who deliver a, a scheme in the UK called Cyber Essentials. And that's stipulated, stipulated by government as kind of the minimum standard for security and, and five mm. sort of basic controls. Roles. And then the fourth part of what we do is something we call community outreach. And that's something we're really proud of in London. In 2023, we visited two and a half thousand businesses face to face. And we do that with uniformed police officers. And we go and talk to those businesses that traditionally what we describe as hard to reach. And we help them understand about cyber risk. So we constantly talk with the other centres about what works, um, bearing in mind that the problem and the scale of cyber crime is going up. Uh, and we're knowing that lots of organisations simply don't see cyber as a priority, which is clearly very worrying. Why don't they see it as a priority? Well, I think there's a few reasons uh, that the first one for us is perhaps they don't understand cyber. So the whole concept of cyber, it's uh, it's in some ways a foreign language. It's terminology mm. that they're not particularly used to. And, and sometimes you'll find businesses just kind of put their hand, hands over their, their ears and, and, and just ignore that. I, mm. I think the second thing we see in, in those cases is that a lot of organizations don't really understand how it may impact them or what the risk looks like. And the third thing is it's just not a priority. I mean, bearing in mind in the UK, like many parts of the Western world, we're facing some quite challenging economic situations. Uh, we're recovering from the pandemic still, and yeah. uh, cyber and security becomes a much lower priority as those businesses prioritise staying in business is the key thing for them. So those are kind of the three things that we're seeing. 
So you go and meet with uh, the small mid-sized businesses. So uh, describe what that looks like when you go out. You 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 said you are with a, a group of people. It sounds like. Yeah, that's right. So we do do events where we invite businesses to to come along and hear us talk about cyber risk. But in our experience, what we generally find are two or well, three types of people who come along to those. Those that already know about cyber. So there's not really a lot we can add to those. We quite often get, sadly, people who've been victims, uh, which is always you know, not great to hear. And we'd rather hopefully engage with them before they fall victim to, to cyber crime. And we often get cybersecurity companies wanting to know what's what's happening. So we turn it on its head and we go out with uniformed police officers. And the idea there is that we talk about um, cyber in general. We quite often talk about other forms of crime and what support and advice is available from government and other resources uh, to, to help them on their way. And it's been really fascinating. The three things we found so far, I think, doing that work over the past 12 months the basic cyber hygiene in place is really, really poor. And in mm. fact, recently we've been going out with parts of government to, to go and uh, see these businesses. And that's one of the key things they've said to us, just how low their basic cyber hygiene is. So that's been helpful in, in feeding that back to government. Secondly is when they do suffer a, an attack or a breach, they don't know where to go to. So they don't know how to mm. report it. And thirdly, if they do need some help, they don't know where to turn to. So they, again, the lack of awareness about what the market looks like and what products and services are out there to support them. So there's a real, uh, I guess what I describe it as an uninformed customer out there in terms of that small business community. So you do have some commercial entities that help you provide some basic level of services. Do you provide that at a cost or a no cost or how, how does that work? So in London, we're, we're really keen to make sure that what we do and deliver is entirely free. And it's about trust. And particularly as our focus is on those hard to reach businesses, it's important for us not to be able to charge for those services. So mm. the only providers that we work with are really ones that are delivering um, government approved schemes. So traditionally, that's Cyber Essentials. Uh, and we work with those Cyber Essentials, what they call certification bodies. And we mm. also are starting to work with Cyber Advisors, which is a new scheme that's been launched by the National Cyber Security Centre. So the NCSC is the UK's technical authority for all things cyber. But otherwise, it's really just getting them to do the really simple, basic stuff that doesn't cost any money and really just only takes a few minutes to put in place. Things like getting a good password, using multi-factor mm. or two-factor verification, backing up data, those really simple things. Yeah. What about phishing? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Phishing accounts for about 80 percent of all cyber crime in the UK, uh, mm -hmm. which I guess is probably very similar in, in the US. So mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons we do security awareness training sessions. It's about spotting the types of phishing emails or the scams that we're seeing and help people spot the difference between a legitimate email uh, or a text message and something that is fake. Obviously, the use of artificial intelligence by cyber criminals is making that harder and that will continue, mm -hmm. I think, in an upward trend. But often it's just those really simple things and, and actually empowering staff to be the first line of defence uh, to prevent those businesses falling victim to, to phishing attacks. So as you, uh, you know, you're a little over a year old, right? And yeah. uh, so what what does the next year hold for you? What what, what are your aspirations and your, your vision beyond that? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, we've got about a million SMEs uh, in, the, in the capital. And obviously, having visited two and a half uh, thousand last year, you know, it's going to take us the best part at that rate, about 500 years to reach all of them. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we do with those two and a half thousand is we go back regularly as well to see how they're getting on on their cybersecurity journey. So we need to upscale significantly. And that's very difficult with the limited budget that we get from, from government. So one of the things I'm trying to roll out for 2024 is a really big volunteering network. So we take mm -hmm. people on board which can range from students with perhaps very limited uh, knowledge or experience in the cyber world but a passion for it right up to people who are operationally competent in a cyber security discipline and we can take those people out at great scale and start getting that message out as far and wide as possible so that's really our big plans for 2024 and also as well just to simplify what we do i'm a great believer in keeping things really simple and mm. as, as i've said before you know the thing for us is that so few of those businesses are getting the basics right that's really what we've got to do. We've got to get them to do those really simple things before they start running. Yeah, you know the uh, you know I'm part of the Safe House initiative, and uh, we you, you really the the CRC of London for London caught our interest immediately, and then we had a chance to meet with you. And you know there's a lot of things we can learn from each other. I think over time, and I think there are other organizations around the world, and I think that you you may be looking to collaborate with others like the Safe House. But do you have any other organizations out there that you think would you'd like to are of interest for you? 
Yeah, it's a really good point, Jeff, actually, because I guess we're quite inward looking at the moment in terms of London. But but we know in order to deliver that message far and wide, uh, we need to partner with organisations. I'm always looking at, at working with partners um, to see how we can get our message out far and wide and, and make that real change and, and add that value to those businesses. And also as well to learn what other countries mm. are doing in tackling the same problems that we're seeing in the UK. And I think that's really important because no one's cracked this yet. Uh, the number of cyber crimes are going up year on year. The number of people falling victim are, are, are increasing. Messaging that we have isn't getting through to the people we really need to get it through. Well, they're not changing the behaviour as a result of that messaging. So I'm always looking at ways of learning on how different people from different countries tackle the same problems and what potentially we can trial here in London uh, to, to make that real difference. Do you work with the, some of the cyber insurance companies out there or they they expressed interest in collaborating with you? Yeah, we do. We work very closely with the cyber insurance industry and they've made huge inroads in the last few years. Um, again, just to give an insight, perhaps the difference between the US and, and the UK, I think in the US, something around about 70 percent, 80 percent of businesses have some form of cyber insurance. In the UK, if I was to say it was 30 percent, that's probably quite generous. Um, mm. So it's still very much in its in its early years in the UK. We're a few years behind from, from where you are in the States. Uh, but we try and work with insurers about educating their customers about the importance and the need for certain minimum standards. So they're a really important stakeholder group for us. So looking back at the last year and a half or a year and a quarter, what would you have done differently? <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, what would I have done differently? Um, I don't know if I would have done anything differently as such. Uh, I would have liked to have done a lot more in terms of particularly our community outreach work uh, and, and raising the profile of that. And certainly I probably would have been a bit more proactive in trying to get more funding in from government and other sources to allow us to upscale what we do. But I'm happy with what we've done in London and the results that we've got so far have been been really successful. We've, we've been looking at the impact we've had in London and we think from the engagement we've done last year, we've mm -hmm. saved the London economy around about a million pounds which is a good start but we want to do more and we want to continue to grow develop get the team working uh, more more broadly as well one of the things that I, I really want to do and i think um you know what has been a real success last year is we've been very proactive in recruiting staff and volunteers who come from the communities that that, are, that reflect uh, you know london's mm, great diversity mm, so we've got mm. people on the team now who speak a number of different languages so from arabic from urdu punjabi uh, we've got people who speak polish lithuanian etc uh, and right. those people are great because they engage really proactively and very well with the communities they serve we did a great pilot last year in north, north london which is home to quite a large turkish community and the difference that that makes when you can speak to those businesses in their own language so again i'd probably like to have done more of that last year but that's certainly not planned for 2024. Would you consider uh, be, uh, or have you thought about doing a, like a documentary almost uh, with the, your outreach because you're out there with these customers and, and it'd be interesting to follow two or three over the next year and kind of do a docu-series. You know, is, is that part of your plans? Yeah, absolutely. We we want to do more on the way of uh, kind of vox pox videos where we're out in the community speaking to businesses because I think that just illustrates you know some of the challenges those businesses have, but but also shows the value of, of what we do and how we help those organisations. So yes, we're trying to do more of that as well uh, this year. Again, it's just I've got a very very small team and it's trying to use them in the most efficient and effective way as possible. Yeah. So as our latest and greatest uh, content contributor to the Safe House Initiative. What things could the Safe House uh, do to help your organization a bit more, if there's anything at all we can do? Yeah, so I think for me, it, it's just about getting that message out and simplifying that cyber message. So we were having a, a conversation early today with, with our advisory board at the centre. And one of the things that we were talking about was was kind of not even using the word cyber and actually starting to think of words and terminology that businesses understand. So, mm -hmm. you know, even using things like fraud or crime, as opposed to cybercrime, phishing, whaling, uh, smishing, and all these new technical terms that, that are mm -hmm. loved by cybersecurity professionals, but really don't mean much to those end users. So I guess for me, it's about just demystifying the landscape and anything that can help us get that message across in a really positive way. The other thing I think is really good as well is, is to try and hear about positive case studies. So yeah. one of my, my personal frustrations is that the cyber industry is quite often built on fear. And what I mean by that is that we're very good at scaring people. So if you do this, or if you don't do this, this is the consequence that you will face. And yeah. people react to that is again, head in the sand, I'm gonna ignore it. 
if we can turn it around to be more positive so that people see cyber as an investment as opposed to a cost, I think that's a real game changer. So the things that, that Safehouse could do, for example, are those case studies of where mm. someone has made a difference to their cyber resilience or their security, and it's enabled them to either grow, to innovate, to win new contracts, because that's the kind of stuff that businesses understand. If they can see how it's going to help them get more pounds and pennies or dollars in the US, then I think that's the bit that will change the behavior. So for me, what I look for is those case studies that are more positive mm. focused as opposed to focused on fear. Yeah, I think that that's a great point in terms of make it a uh, perspective of an investment as opposed to, you know, some dire consequences because uh, everybody's tired of having negative things thrown at them. Maybe a positive twist would be a good thing. Yeah, definitely. And 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 again, you know, and I, and I use this analogy, it's 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 a it's a kind of a dangerous one to use. But if I was to put an event out there and advertise it, how to make a million pounds off social media, I'd probably have quite a large number of companies queuing up because mm. they think, great, I can make some money. If I was to put an advert out there for a for an event around bo- boost your cyber resilience, you know, I get a handful of people who come along to it. So we've somehow got to flip it the other way to make it and, and to use the language that businesses go, you know what, this is going to be great for my business, great for my customers, my staff, and I can see some value in it. So I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in that area. I, you know, I look forward to collaborating with uh, with you and the CRC because I think there's a lot of great things we can do over the next year that would be very helpful to, uh, to yeah. help change that perspective, I think. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and I think your passion and uh, your positive outlook is going to be in you know, your leadership is really going to help uh, do that, too. So, yeah, I look forward to working with you. Yeah, likewise, absolutely. Any other thoughts you would have for our audience? If there's one thing you could do today to help position yourself and be more resilient and be more competitive as a, as a business, what would you suggest to them? Yeah, so I go back to this point about, about getting the basics right. And, and for me, you know, even putting in place something like two-factor or multi-factor authentication, I think the evidence that we've got suggests that around about 40% of cybercrime could be prevented if you just do that. And again, going back to that point about phishing being the most common cause, if we mm. use 2FA, MFA, that can make all the difference. It's a simple thing that we can do very quickly. doesn't cost any money. If every business did that, you know, we're not making promises here that you're going to be completely secure, but it's about making you less attractive as your next door neighbor. So just that's the one thing we always say to people, sort that out and that will make all the difference. And if you get that right, then you're, you're on the right path to becoming much more cyber resilient. Simon, it's a definite pleasure to have this time with you and to uh, to learn about the CRC. And we wish you all the best over the next year and uh, look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you very much. Likewise. Have a great day. And thanks for your contributions to the Safe House. Thank you, Jeff. That's our podcast for today. I'm Jeff Edwards for the Safe House Initiative. Thanks for joining us. And remember, be safe, be resilient, and be kind to each other. For more information on the Safe House Initiative, please use your mobile device to scan the QR code on the screen. Send us an email at safehouseinitiative.org at gmail.com or visit us on our website, safehouseinitiative.org. We look forward to hearing from you.